Well, welcome. I am Steve Wexler, and, and along with Jeffrey Schaefer, um, we've been trying to resurrect the great discussions and debates that we had in writing the big book of dashboards. And um, I'm the founder of Data Revelations, uh, inaugural Iron Viz champion at Tableau, and uh, author of the big book of dashboards. Um, and I'm I had a fantastic time with my partner in crime, Jeff Schaefer and Andy Cotgreave. And one of the best aspects was debating, discussing, arguing, and learning from my two colleagues as they would show and discuss different ways of, of interpreting the same data. So with that, I want to introduce you. If uh, James Brown was the hardest working man in show, show business, let me introduce you to the hardest working man in viz business, and that would be Jeff Schaefer. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Always a great introduction. Uh, Jeff Schaefer here, Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of IT and Analytics at Unifun in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, also adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati where I teach data visualization, one of the uh, 30 Tableau Zen Masters and one of the three uh, authors of the big book of dashboards. Great to be here. And uh, we have a special guest uh, with us today, which is uh, uh, Amanda, and Amanda will, uh, I'll pass it to you, Amanda, to introduce yourself. Hi, thanks for having me as the guest speaker today. I'm Amanda McCulloch. I'm the data visualization lead at Excella, a technology consulting firm based in Washington, D.C. I also volunteer as the operations director for the Data Visualization Society. Um, my roots are in public health, though, and doing data visualization in public health, and it's delightful to be joining you guys today to talk all about different charts. Uh, Amanda, if, uh, delighted to have you, and if what we do today is half as invigorating and interesting as the uh, practice that we had yesterday, this should be uh, entertaining stuff. Um, we are trying a new format and a new platform, and we may stumble a bit, so my apologies if that happens. Uh, in any case, here is our agenda. Um, Amanda is going to tell us a little bit about the Data Visualization Society. I'm going to discuss a little bit about Mona Chalabi and, um, or Chalabi, pardon me, and an example of a great visualization that she did a few weeks ago, uh, which I guess would we could call a, a Mary Mako chart or a Mako chart. Jeff's going to go a little more in depth on that. We're going to banter a little bit about it. Um, then we're going to try a lightning round where we're going to uh, show some stuff that has interested all of us over the last two weeks or so. And um, then we'll leave it open to Q&A at the end. So, um, Amanda, tell us a little bit about the Data Visualization Society. So the Data Visualization Society is a global tool agnostic community for data viz designers, developers, practitioners, people just enthusiastic about learning about data visualization. Uh, we were founded back in February of 2019, so almost a year ago. We're coming up on our one-year anniversary, and we have over 11,000 members who have joined us from around the world. Uh, it's been an exciting year because we've been able to create a really vibrant Slack workspace for connecting on things like sharing uh, examples of visualizations, both great ones and ones that people are looking for feedback on, connecting people in different cities with in-person events, finding ways to connect the community just more broadly, not just within our tool-specific disciplines like the Tableau user groups do so well, but rather bringing people together around best practices in data visualization design. Uh, it's an open organization. We would love to have more of you who are joining us on the line today or listening to this later join us. And as an extra little Easter egg, once you go ahead and you join the Data Viz Society, you can get your own custom DDF badge. So check it out. Uh, go ahead and check us out at datavisualizationsociety.com to learn more. And uh, Amanda, if you get a chance, maybe you can uh, put that in the chat window and people can just um, don't click the link right now. Click it later. Um, but just so that it's read, or they can copy the link. Otherwise, you're going to end up not watching the webinar, which would be sad. Uh, in any case, this is Mona Chalabi, uh, who does unique and great data visualization work. She's best known for her work at The Guardian, though she now lives in New York. Um, I think she did a stint at 538. And let me show you the visualization that came through to my Twitter feed, and I just went, ah. What a great way to explain a difficult concept. And explaining how the marginal tax rate works, at least in the UK, and there's a similar concept in the United States as well. Um, and 
people think, oh, I'm in this certain tax bracket. I'm in the 40% tax bracket. Um, so if I make 100,000, 40% of my tax is being taken. So I'm only keeping 60% and 40% um, is going to the government. And that's not how it works. Um, it's when you reach certain thresholds, different tax rates kick in. Um, you actually pay 0% if we look at the bottom diagram, if you earn 100,000, um, the first 12 and a half K, you don't pay tax on that at all. The next 37 and a half K in pounds, you pay 20% and then the remainder you pay uh, 40%. So in fact, you're only paying 27.5 uh, in taxes. And I just really liked this chart and um, it is, oh my goodness, this is a chart that I, have explored but have never used in practice, it's a Merimeco chart. So um, uh, Jeff, you and I have had tons of discussions and debates about this. So um, I think I'm gonna uh, pass over control to you at this point and um, you can lead the choir in a discussion of uh, Meco charts. Sure, uh, I guess here, is the screen showing up here? It is on mine. Uh, so the data viz catalog uh, describes the MECO chart as sort of 100% stacked bar going in both directions. So I guess just trying to figure out what we call a MECO, um, a Mary MECO or a mosaic plot. Um, it's usually done like this. Now we see lots of variations on that and its current form here, I'd say it's almost like a, a love child between 100% stacked bar chart and a tree map. Um, you kind of put them together and, and you sort of get a 100% stack bar going in both directions, right? Um, now we see lots of variations on that. Uh, for example, here, um, they don't use a percentage going in both directions. And um, this is a great blog post uh, that I found on Meco Graphics talking about why you might use a, a Meco chart. And I, I think the whole point is it gives you another uh, variable to look at. Not only are you looking at just the, the percentage of something, but you're also, you know, taking into account the, you know, the quantity. In this case, billions of dollars against the percentage of what they are. Um, other examples I've found, and I, I know Steve, you want to weigh in on this one, but you know, this is again billions of dollars going on your X axis against percentage on your Y, showing how the console games versus the mobile games are are moving sort of over time. So you have this element of time, and then you also have the quantity of of that that billions of dollars are being measured in that variable width of the the bar. Yes. So, Jeff, you know, I see something like this and wondering, is this going to confuse my audience? I see a stacked bar chart where, you know, you see the stuff in the middle is growing. My tendency would be, gee, I'm wondering if we can just go with a regular stacked bar chart uh, and putting the thing we're most interested in at the bottom. And I can see um, it, it'll be easy to see how big mobile games is growing. And it will be easy for me to see that, you know, we're now at 180 billion forecast for uh, 2021. Um, and that it's going to be more than twice as big as the 71 billion that we have, because everything will have the things we want to compare will have a common baseline. So I'm, I'm, yeah, my tendency would be, gee, maybe we can do something which is a little easier to understand. Maybe taking it apart. I found this one recently. We had some great dialogue on this this yesterday uh, around the the size of the world lakes. We have the area on the the x, and we have the depth, the maximum depth on the on the y axis. I, th I thought this was beautifully done, the color and and really kind of shows you know lakes that have a large area versus um, you know a deeper depth. The, 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 I'm, I'm wondering if people would be confused as I was and, and that, you know, you're seeing this big box for the Caspian Sea. And if you hover over it, you get some detail, you know, information saying, you know, technically it's a lake. And gee, is, is, is that the area of the lake, this big box versus um, uh, the uh, Bacal, um, which is that really depth? And it turns out the x-axis is the surface area and mm -hmm. Um, the y-axis is the depth, and, and, and Amanda, you pointed out, well, and it's the depth at its deepest part. So, right. you know, that square or that rectangle that we see for the Caspian Sea, that's volume. That's overall volume. 
because the, the X is the surface, overall surface area, and then the, the Y part, the part down, is the overall, the, the, the deepest depth. But then we have the issue of variable depths, right, Steve? So in terms of volume, it's a little bit misleading from a volume perception because it assumes that there's a consistent deepest point that it is throughout the entire surface area, which isn't really true for any of these lakes if anyone's ever been to Wisconsin and waded into a lake before. Uh, by the way, I'm seeing somebody commenting, maybe it is average depth. And, you know, and, and one of the nice things is uh, Takafumi, and I'm, I'm with you, Jeff, this is some gorgeous work and major props to the extra effort of getting the gradient fill to show the depth. Uh, this is downloadable, and I can see, you know, what's under the hood and, 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 and how it was built. And overall, I get the, you know, the idea, oh my gosh, look how deep that thing is. Oh my God, look how you know, vast this lake is. So I, th I think this is beautiful work. Well, a couple along those lines, if you remember a couple episodes ago in uh, Chart Chat, we discussed uh, Florence Nightingale's rose diagram and had a, a long discussion about that and how the, the wedges, if you will, um, show the, the people that died in the Scutari uh, hospital. Um, you'll also recall in that di diagram, um, I did a redesign that was based on an essay called The Speaking of Graphics in, in 2006, uh, where Dr. Louis did a diagram that looked like this, and, it, and it's another variation. In this case, there's not 100% on, on, the, on the Y, but the variable width bar chart. And so I thought I would just point that out, that I think we can, we can use variable width bar charts. I think they work. In this case, they represent periods of time when they're looking at deaths per 1,000 soldiers. Well, that 1,000 soldiers happens at different intervals. You don't have necessarily 1,000 soldiers in a monthly period, uh, so each interval of a 1,000 soldiers is, is measured, um, so it's sort of standardized, if you will, and I thought this was a great way that Dr. Louie looked at it, and in my redesign, I, I, I sort of shifted it to this. Um, the, the last one I wanted to talk about was a uh, very famous data set um, that, that is the background to Simpson's Paradox. If you're not familiar with it, it it's a UC Berkeley gender biased uh, study uh, that uh, the university was concerned about the rate in which they were admitting men versus women. They initiated a study on this topic. And, uh, and what's interesting is that at a whole, uh, the, it looks like the men are admitted at a, a quite significant higher rate, but when you dive into the parts in the 85 departments underneath it, it actually shows the opposite. It actually shows that it was actually slightly biased toward women. Uh, and when they look at the top six departments, which is what's often visualized, uh, it, it really shows that point. There's four of those departments uh, that are here in white that show more on women than, than in men. The reason I, I point this out is there's a, a visualization that Datablick did, um, a, a great blog post on how to create a Mary Mecco chart, and they converted this data into a Mecco. And, and the reason is, is because they're trying to show the percent of the total applicants, the men versus the women in each department, but they're also trying to show that each department doesn't have the same size. And so the, the X here becomes the number of applicants where department A is just much, much bigger than department E or department F. And then we have the, the overall. I, I will just add, you know, to Steve's point, to, is it complex and hard to visualize? I tend to break these things apart. Can I visualize the variable width of a bar in a different way? And so my take on this particular data set is, is more like this, to simply break it apart and say, okay, the, the size of the department is in the background bar chart so that I can see that A is bigger than B and I can see it really, it's almost you know double, uh, not quite. Um, and I can see really quickly men versus women with the little bar charts. Uh, I can see the overall and I can compare inside of each department. So, so for me, I would say I, I've not used a Mary Mecco chart actually in the wild other than, you know, maybe some variable width and I, I tend to break them apart. Okay, I'm um, just responding to Lynn who said, how do you get the gradient fill? Um, I downloaded the, the workbook and apparently there are some techniques from Kevin and Ken Flerledge that were employed and um, these people have way more patience than I do when I saw what was involved in creating the gradient fill. Um, uh, let me share my screen at this point. Uh,
And uh, in looking at um, Mona Chalabi's work and thinking, how would I explain it? What would I do differently? I kind of went down a rabbit hole and uh, um, it ended up finding some interesting quotes from Ronald Reagan. And it also made me think of some interesting quotes from George Harrison, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, in any case, um, for something that I have never um, actually put into practice, I've spent a fair amount of time looking at this chart and wondering what's the value of it, how does it work? And I saw a very good example that Emma White had put together. And I think this was from a Makeover Monday or from a junk charts and showing um, the pipeline problem in the United States about the number of women that were uh, in certain executive positions and that you have percentage of the workforce, you have entry level managers, senior directors, vice president, senior vice president, and C-suite. And the bar length is such that, that, gee, you have way more people who are entry level than you have people in the C-suite, not surprising. Um, uh, how do you show this? You know, the 81% men versus 19% women down over here. So Emma had suggested making this Merimako, and I'd never seen a Merimako before this or before Jonathan Drummey and Datablick had published that. And the first thing I look at when I see a, a foreign chart type, you know, I suffer from xenographophobia, uh, which is fear of foreign chart types, is, is there another way to do this? Um, and I kind of went down the, 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 the the, the rabbit hole with this. So I can see the width is how many people are in entry level versus managers. And the width over here for C level is so little. And then we can see the proportion of men versus women. So I thought, well, gee, you know, maybe let's just, you know, make this 100% stack bar chart and do a, a marginal histogram here to show the percentage of jobs. And it just didn't resonate with me. So I tried this, I tried this, I tried this. Um, I saw someone tried to do a funnel and the problem with this is that the proportions are way off. And I kind of like the Merimako. Jeff still encouraged me to try some other experiments. And I do like this jitter plot. And it's really, the, the big takeaway is, oh, I can see that there are a lot more entry level people then there are vice presidents, then there are C-suite, and I can see the proportion of them. Um, just a quick note on this, if you, know, you are uh, deciding, gee, you wanna know how to you know, make one of these things, um, there, are, there are easy and harder ways uh, to build it. I still think um, a stack bar chart um, will do the job just fine in most of the cases. Um, I did do some, um, additional work on uh, trying to see, hey, how could I uh, bring uh, Mona's work to life here? And I started experimenting with Tableau's animation. So here is an attempt, uh, um, an incipient attempt to get this across. Um, you pay 0% on the first 12 and a half K, 20% on the next, and here's how it could uh, fill up. I also think this is a great time where we can use a, a, a pie chart. Um, I, you know, this is a much maligned and deservedly so chart type, but in fact, um, you know, quick question, is the taxes more or less than half? Oh, well, that's quite a bit less than half. Is it more or less than a quarter? Oh, it's a little more than a quarter. I can see that immediately. Okay, your actual, you know, your, a little more than one quarter is going to taxes. And I experimented with some animation in this and seeing, you know, would this work? Would, you know, would there be a, a way to tell this? And um, yeah, it, I like the other one where the three things kind of unfold, but given that um, Mona had just a static format for this. Um, uh, I just thought her example was great. Um, Amanda, um, I know you have some thoughts on this as well. So uh, you want to take over screen share? Sure thing. <clears throat> so I want to circle back and talk a little bit more about Mona's chart as we wrap up our, our Mecco section. Uh, the thing that Steve maintained in his animations that I also loved about Mona's chart were these, were these annotations. 
Um, text and annotation layers are one of the more powerful things about visualizations that communicate well. And given the context within which this was delivered on a social media post, I think she kept it simple, which was great, and had those nice, nice annotations here that help you really easily see kind of what you should be taking away from that chart, which is great for easy understanding. Uh, the question that it then kind of begged for me is, I mean, I don't live in the UK and I live somewhere else, but we also have a marginal tax system in the US. Kind of what's in it for me and how do I see myself in this kind of data? That question of how does a chart make you think about something else? And there's a lot of these kind of explainers that we see out there in the wild now from the New York Times and others where you can plug in and put in a number of your own choosing and get recommendations or different charts and graphs that change accordingly. And so I looked around a little bit and thought, well, what would this look like in a WIFM type context? And lo and behold, there is a tax calculator that you can use, various ones from different places that enable you to go ahead and kind of plug in what is your salary and how much will you pay or not pay and what will change based on who's in power which I thought was an interesting set of, of numbers, but it's not nearly as compelling as the hand-sketched, hand-drawn chart that Mona put out there. So sometimes I think that we take things that are more beautiful or just engaging or, or interesting and put them out there in the data viz space, because even if they're less precise, perhaps, like these numbers are quite precise. Hey, um, I uh, also uh, thought Amanda, something. can I just, uh, the, you know, you said the hand-drawn thing, and that's that. Yeah. Thing. You know that's the you know, um, the aspect of Mona's work, um, and it, and I think it helps draw people in. It's oh, let me explain this to you in a way that's not intimidating. Now it turns out her her graphs are spot on accurate, um, but that hand drawn thing is 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 really gives this um, uh, a very friendly um, explanation of something that some people have a hard time grappling with. For sure. And her behind the scenes process videos and little views she's done on Instagram stories on how she makes these hand drawn charts to be so precise are excellent. Highly encourage folks to take a look at that. Uh, when I was thinking about some of the other feedback we saw on this chart, some of the other feedback was that it wasn't specific enough and left out some of the nuance of taxes. They are complicated. And so I, I dug around a little bit more and thought in my head that something like a thank you chart, which isn't always the best fit for purpose because they can be a bit complex to read, actually suits okay in this kind of example because it easily shows you from the start what your total gross income is. And this that little tool actually lets you plug in your own numbers. So it meets that with them piece too. And then gets back over to at the end of the day, how much are you paying in tax and how much do you get to keep? But then it shows you that breakdown in the middle for people who want to see more details. So I thought it was a nice example of where if you're trying to get more granular and show more nuance around this data story, you might want to dig in and actually be able to break that out into different segments so that you could look at how that gross income breaks down more granularly, which I thought was nice and also, like I said, meets that with them principle. Uh, but at the end of the day, when I look at these together, um, if you think about what you'd see on social media and like what kind of link you'd see or the little kind of social media teaser that would make data and information feel accessible about a complicated topic, that's again, to your point, Steve, I just think that Mona's chart does a great job of really drawing people in, that hand-drawn effect. You saw a couple of people emulate it with other countries' tax codes, which I thought was fun, um, and no barrier to entry there, right? You don't have to know a certain tool or tech stack or coding platform. You can draw this yourself, and I think there's something really accessible and nice about the sketching component of what she's done here. Um, Amanda, I think you're really spot on with the what's in it for me. Initially, when I decided, hey, let me see what it would be like to try to remake this in Tableau, it, it was going to be type in what your salary is. I also couldn't help seeing this thing as being a timeline. And I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, the first six, seven weeks I'm working, I'm not taxed at all. And then the next um, 19 weeks I'm working, I'm taxed at this rate. And then I'm taxed at this much higher rate. And that's why I have pictures of... Ronald Reagan um, and George Harrison, because when David Stockman was working in the, um, in the Reagan administration, Reagan would tell about when he was um, a movie star in the 40s and that, you know, He's not making a, a, a weekly salary per se. He's being paid for each of the pictures. And it was, well, you know, once he reached a certain threshold, he was being taxed at a 90% rate. So they said, we all just stopped making pictures. We made four pictures. And then we took the rest of the, the year off because it didn't make sense to be taxed at that higher rate. And indeed, you know, if this were to play out over time, there would be something which would be remarkably um, demoralizing about, gee, the more I'm working, the, you know, the, uh, the, the less take-home pay I'm making each week. So it's amortized over the entire time, at least, you know, Jeff 
Jeff and I discussed this and he said, well, it, you're, you don't get no, none taken out. It's amortized, at least in the United States. I would imagine it is in England as well. And of course, yeah. George Harrison wrote Tax Man, where the tax rate, you know, with the top earners was 95% in the mid 60s. So there's the George mm -hmm. Harrison connection. There you go. So I know um, we promised we'd get to a couple lightning topics. Is it time to transition over to those, Steve? Uh, yeah, Jeff, you have any thoughts on, on, the, on the Mako or any of the stuff? Jeff, we can't hear you. You're... I, no problem. Um, I, uh, I, I love Mona's color and, and, and annotation layer. I, I, the, the things you mentioned, it's just so engaging of a chart. So I, I don't have anything to add. You guys hit all the great stuff. By the way, and these greens and reds are, in fact, colorblind friendly. Hmm. Just letting those in the audience go, why are you giving Mona a pass? She's using green and red. Well, those green, green and red are just fine. There you go. Uh, lightning, lightning, so, lightning. Lightning on. So, uh, I, so let's go ahead and talk about a couple of things that we, we collectively have found interesting or uh, interesting to dig into and talk about from the data viz space in the last couple of weeks or, or further back. Uh, top of mind for me right now is how tools think. Um, I work a lot in Tableau, uh, but recently have been challenged to go ahead and do some work in Power BI. And the challenge I found is that Tableau fundamentally thinks in marks in space. If you have a kind of data, if you have data, quantitative data, that you can place along an X and a Y axis and then place marks in space along the lines of what the grammar of graphics defines as kind of a framework for visualization, you can build pretty much anything. Uh, the simple example of a strip plot you can construct in a few moments. It gives you a nice breakout and distribution, shows you outliers, has lots of great detail that's really helpful on the dashboard. Um, contrasting that with my experience recently in Power BI, which thinks specifically in visualizations or specifically in charts, where you have to pick your chart first and then go ahead and plug in your numbers and your data. And I have found that very constraining over the last couple of weeks. Um, I actually went ahead and went to Twitter with my challenge and got over a dozen responses and very kind-hearted people willing to pitch in and help me make that transition over. Um, and at the end of the day, what I found is that I have kept uh, feeling frustrated because there wasn't a simple option to go back to that grammar of graphics framework for how a tool thinks. You can't necessarily overcome that. So uh, still tinkering with that a bit, but a challenge nonetheless. I know you both are Tableau enthusiasts, so um, any thoughts from your side on the challenges of working in, in marks versus visualizations and charts? You know, I think it's spot on. I, I tell people when I, when I do Tableau training, Tableau is really just an X, Y canvas. Your columns are your X, your rows are your Y, your marks put marks on top of your, your canvas. Um, and, and it's not a chart generator like, uh, like Excel or Power BI where you literally generate an object and then have to manipulate that object into some form that, that isn't what it's intended to be. So I, I, I agree with you 100%. Much more like a code-based visualization, right? I mean, this is the same kind of library that you'd use in R or something else. And maybe I have a newfound enthusiasm or newfound empathy for my full-stack developers turned data viz developers um, here at Excella who, uh, when they have to work inside of these kind of tools, uh, really yearn for being able to have the flexibility of D3, which is kind of beyond my own personal tech stack. Well, you know, when we were discussing this yesterday, you harped on the, 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 the notion of the grammar of graphics. And it was a phrase that, that, that I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with. And do you want to elaborate a little bit? And Jeff, you had some, some stuff. Oh, I didn't realize that, which I found fascinating. So I'm going to ask you to repeat it. Sure. Yes, I'm going to defer to you as the professor on this one. Yeah, The Grammar of Graphics, a book by Leland Wilkinson. We've talked about his dot plots before on Chart Chats. Uh, great book to check it out. He talks about these layers and how marks and, and, and points are layered in, into a graphic. And uh, it's really the fundamental, if anybody's used R and, and used uh, plotting GG plots and use that package, uh, that's what the GG stands for, Grammar of Graphics. And so it's, it's really kind of the foundation. If you think about how that's built into Tableau, it, it really is built in the same way where you have these marks on top of each other in sort of a Z order. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic and maybe we should make a chart chat episode about it. The, um, I just, uh, oh, can you just go back to that slide? Um, um, I just wanna have praise for the marks card. <laughs> um, and, and, that, and that, you know, it, it, it changed significantly between version seven and version eight, but the amount of stuff that you can control and the UI and the, and for me, the intuitiveness of most of it in this ridiculously compact space, 
blows me away. So, you know, hats off to that design that's there. Um, Jeff, Agreed. do we um, do you want to do the annotation or should we just go to curved lines? Uh, I can do it really quickly. It's um, it's very short. It's a blog post by Alberto Cairo on uh, how he loves the annotation layer. And I, this is a Financial Times uh, visualization that he uses in that blog post that he points to. And it's really beautifully done, just like Amanda pointed out on, on Mona's chart, the annotation layer to me. Jeff, um, do you want to share it? Um, it's not sharing. Um, no. sure, there you, there go. you go. There you go. I had to click it twice. Um, so that's, uh, it's really beautifully done. And I, I think uh, really kind of points to the, uh, the same thing that, that Mona had in, in her chart, a really thick, beautiful uh, annotation layer. And I've got one um, for lightning round here, Ludovic Tavernier, who does just um, insanely great work, and he's written a blog post on how, how to build nice curvy line chart splines with Tableau. And I hate that I so prefer this to just the straight line. Um, um, the, the, here, here's the issue that people have about these curves, is they're saying, oh, you're introducing um, uh, or modifying the data in a way that's 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 not accurate. You know, the, to to create the curve that needs to be there, you are manipulating the data. Albeit in this case, it's a very subtle curve and very slight. I would argue when you have um, uh, line charts and you're connecting January to February, February to March, and you have these sharp lines, it it suggests that it it's going at this certain rate at this certain slope. Um, well, but, but is it? Did it go continuously at that rate or did it jump around a little bit? So you're, you know, anytime, the only thing that's accurate is if you do these things as step lines or jump lines where, well, this is what it was in February and this is what it was in March and we don't want to suggest that there was this smooth uptick throughout the entire month. So um, I would argue that a, a line chart connecting two different points in time um, is introducing things that may not be in the data. I also think with the subtle change in the curve is no different than having a lollipop chart where there's a little dot at the end. And yes, you're introducing a little imprecision, but I think the aesthetic allure is so much greater to the very small amount of imprecision. And Jeff, I know you, you, you brought up a really good point yesterday, so I don't want to steal your thunder on this. So why don't you weigh in on, on it? Go ahead. No, I, I just, uh, without the dots, I, I worry That's that you don't, you don't know exactly where those points connect. And if you had straight lines, um, you, you can see the intersection of the two lines a little easier, depending on the slope, obviously. But uh, I, I just think that, you know, in this particular instance with the dots and the, the, point, you know, the labels, you have the exact value. So there's no, there's no worry that you're going to mess this up. The uh, agreed, I would just really like to see this built into the tool as opposed to uh, the extra amount of work it would take just to get a little bit of curviness uh, in this thing. So, um, and I promise Tableau, if you put it in the product, I promise not to abuse it. Um, <laughs> so, um, oh, let me, you know, just move to uh, just a couple of odds and ends on this thing. Uh, workshops and resources, bigbookofdashboards.com. You can find chart chat. You can find a recording of this chart chat and the other ones that we've had. And my guess is in a few days, we'll have a link to where you can register for the next chart chat. We also have some workshops, building world-class business dashboards uh, coming up over the next month or two. So um, please bookmark or check out bigbookofdashboards.com. And um, uh, we've encroached a little bit on, on our time, but why don't we open this up to um, Q&A. Oh, Shanna uh, Smith is asking, any plans to come out to Hawaii anytime? Ooh, I got dibs on that public workshop, Jeff. Uh, actually, I have relatives there, so I actually may be planning a, a trip there at some point, so. Um, um, Mark Paul, Lee is asking, can you provide the link to the curvy charts I wanted? That was a screen share. Um, Jeff, I'll do a little um, digging on this uh, and we'll find the link for it. Oh, wow, man, hold on. Um, but you, know, you just sent it to all panelists. Let me just copy that. 
um, uh, so attendees can see it as well. Um, Akfil, thank you so much for that. And, uh, and here's another one as um, well done. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for saving me the, ooh, let me scrounge and find that. Um, should we just keep this in, in the chat for now, the discussion it seems to be working as opposed to the formal Q and A. Looks like we're, we had some questions. So I saw a quiet, I thought I answered it, but it looked like I just responded to the panelist. I think on the uh, oceans chart, that technique, um, it, she created a separate uh, worksheet with gradient color and layered a sheet on top of it. And then the trickery part was the, there's a stacked bar and there's a white stacked bar below all of the lakes and that's how, she, how uh, I believe um, I think she got the, the gradient color on there. The, um, and hats off to the patients in doing that. Okay, and there was a question that we got ahead of time from, from Kevin F in Cincinnati and he wants to know what do we think of data art? Uh, I think it depends on the context, Steve, and where it's being used and how it's being used. That's, that's my MO on data art. I think data art's beautiful. I was fortunate enough to attend the IIB Awards this year and get to help to be a shortlist judge, and there is incredible data art that's happening. I think the challenge I find is when I see uh, clients in business contexts wanting their business dashboards for decision making to look like data art. And I do think we have to think about the kind of fit for purpose of those different kinds of data visualization products. The um, great blog post a while back from Adam McCann, where he discusses, he takes the same data set and he does data art, he does an infographic and he does a business dashboard. So, so instead of wondering where's the link or whatever, just one, you should be following Adam McCann if you're not. He just does great work and he shares it uh, wonderfully with the community. So just type Adam McCann data art and you'll find some in really interesting take that he has on this. So you're saying I shouldn't post that link that I just found into the chart chat, Steve? You can go ahead, make it easy for people. Gosh, but they're never going to learn how to do stuff on their own. <laughs> Googling is a skill. And you are correct. If you look at Adam McCann and data art, this does immediately come up. <laughs> yeah, this is how, look, as long as I know the person's name and roughly what they're trying to do, I'm set. You know, if you didn't know it was Ludovic Tavernier, okay, you know, you're not, you know, um, 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 I'm being asked for the acceptance of gender chart. Are we going to share that out, Steve? Or sorry, Jeffrey? Uh, sure. I can do that. So we've got a, a formal question here. Someone discovered the Q&A from Laura Frere. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Amanda mentioned the importance and the significance annotations in play. I'm wondering about your all thoughts on the balance between choosing a simple chart type that doesn't use annotation and those that are a bit more difficult to understand off the cusp, Merameco charts with annotations that will walk you through. Um, I definitely have some thoughts on the annotation layer on the stuff and, and why they're really hard to do with dashboards that are changing all the time. But um, Jeff or Amanda, if you want to weigh in first. Sounds like another chart chat uh, episode. Uh, yeah, know. this could be an entire, boy, you just asked, yeah. Laura, do you have a half hour? Um. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I mean, I think that you can, I think that it, it depends on kind of what you're training people to do, right? So annotations can be those text pop-ups. They also can be things like those data-driven legends that have become popular to help understand different kinds of visualizations, but it depends on how fast someone needs to interpret it. Um, I tend to lean on simpler charts that you can learn to read over time in dashboards and then adding in tooltips or other ways to help people understand them if they need to learn without cluttering up your frame. But I, I do think it's a tricky balance and I know Steve has strong feelings. The, the, I've got a whole thing that's in the works about about storytelling and should you be doing storytelling in a dashboard? Yeah, you certainly can, but um, uh, I, I think going to say something controversial. Um, I think a dashboard it is 
can be best when it helps you find where the most interesting and important things are in your data. I think it is okay for a dashboard to be boring, but the, the presentation that you build on the findings in the dashboard, that should be riveting. And, and yes, you can you can make it riveting and you can do story points or you can do these long, long form dashboards and both Jeff and, and uh, Amanda know my thoughts on the long form dashboards. We, we decided to defer that to another time. Um, but the, 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 the issue of curating results. So, so let me step back for a minute. Um, you, the dashboard can really facilitate finding uh, the amazing stories in your in your data quickly. What do you then do with it? Um, and well, you may want to curate the results. I want to find the most important things and make it easy for people to to see what's important about them. And that may mean having arrows and boxes and things pointing to stuff. Can you do stuff like that automatically in the dashboard? Yeah, you can. Um, uh, some of it is pretty difficult to do based on the conditions and making sure, oh, the label that fit great when the data was like this now looks terrible when the data is like this, uh, et cetera. But in trying to teach some of this stuff, yeah, the, 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 the annotation layer can be great. And Mona did it brilliantly. One of the tools for Tableau users out there that I'll just mention, we use this all the time on our dashboards and, and even in general visualizations is the collapsible containers that you have now. So you can build a annotation layer that just collapses and you, know, you hit a button, it drops your annotation layer on a screen uh, and then you can you know, make it disappear. So you can have these beautiful annotation layers that don't get in the way of the, the visualization. And, 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 and that, I've seen that used to stunning effect. I haven't done it myself, and I probably should. Um, well, and I, would, I, would, I would add, Steve, I think to your point that uh, a big part of this, I think, is also semantics on what we're calling what kind of visualization product. When you're talking about annotation layers on dashboards versus Mona's was an infographic that was hand sketched and meant to be shared on social media, where you need those annotations to be there, where it's a static something versus something that's changing. We just had a whole topic in data viz conversation about kind of what is a dashboard and, and, and where are they going? What do they mean nowadays now that it's such an overused phrase? So another topic for a different chart chat probably. Yeah, and, and Jeff, I just want to mention the example that you had and sorry, um, uh, you know, give Jeff another 18 seconds and he'll find the example um, of that is over an overlay that explains, well, here's how this dashboard works and here's what the widgets are as opposed to um, something which is dynamically changing and, and calling out an important data point um, in the thing, which is much trickier if you have your data that's constantly changing. Yeah, I would point to, uh, I guess, uh, Danushki De La Vera's Firebird suite that was uh, um, actually on the uh, short list of the uh, the information is beautiful that you mentioned. And, and she had a great annotation layer on that uh, where you have uh, instructions, uh, right? So you can you can click on, uh, hopefully you're seeing this, but you we are, and it's working great. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so it really brings the static form viz, you know, with all of the arrows and all of the things. What are you supposed to do? What can you click? And, and even filters down, you know, to the bottom of the viz. And then when you close it, you know, you're left to interact with it. So, yeah, that's, that's one example of many. All right. Maybe we'll take one more question as we still mm -hmm. have a, um, uh, a bunch of people who are hanging out with us. Is there a difference? Sorry, there was a question about this. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the difference between a sand key chart and alluvia, alluvial diagram, uh, and saw Amanda's article. So I'll let I'll let Amanda take the definition question. Ooh, I, I'm actually probably the wrong one on that one because <laughs> that article was a summary of a lot of brilliant people in a conversation we have. So Jeffrey, I'm going to lot that one back to you because <laughs> I just had to look up what alluvial diagram meant. Yeah, so alluvial <laughs> diagrams are usually uh, probably the better name for what most of us refer to as sand key diagrams. And, and I don't know who or why or how, but somehow sand key became sort of the general term of it. They are uh, a different. I would say a sand key diagram is a type of alluvial diagram is probably what I would say. But um, most of the sand key diagrams that we see 
and called today. We've kind of taken that name over and uh, probably more accurately referred to as an alluvial diagram. But hey, we call things like that all the time, right? A barbell chart, a, a dumbbell chart, a connected dot plot or a dot plot, jitter plot, you know, all those things have all kinds of various names. So Yeah, and within certain areas, it's also called a gap chart. The, um, uh, and, and, and part of it is knowing what the thing is called in, within, the, you know, within the tool that you're using. Like, I'm not sure if you type in, how do I create a gap chart uh, in Tableau that you'll get all the great how-to articles that you would get if you typed in barbell chart or dumbbell chart. Um, um, also, I just want to go on the record that, yes, I'm asking for slightly curvy lines, but whenever I see sand keys or alluvial diagrams or chord diagrams, uh, I'm usually suspicious that, 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 that I'm wondering, is this the best way to show it, or are you just trying to show off that you know how to make one of these things, just for the record? Um, I have a last question is from Gloria, and, and interestingly, this is kind of um, um, mirroring or, or parroting a question that, that Alberto Cairo had. His was specifically about learning Tableau and said, you know, how do I learn Tableau? Gloria is asking, hey, this is the first time and I'm very interested in the topic. How do I begin this journey? And I'm, I'm inferring uh, the journey to learning about data visualization. Um, and um, thoughts from either of you? So, Gloria, I would I would definitely say say starting with some foundational best practices around data visualization design. So, some of the books that are out there, there's some great ones on visualization best practices for different contexts. So, Storytelling with Data is a great kind of foundational book about data visualization that doesn't veer into too much specifics about how you construct and pull different kinds of charts together. Um, I think that a thing I would recommend is maybe joining the Data Visualization Society. Uh, we have a ton of resources for people who are new or early career. Actually, I have two board members who are deliberately from an early career perspective who help to kind of curate and curate resources and Q&As for people who are just joining this kind of uh, learning journey like you describe it. So I would highly encourage you to check out Data Viz Society uh, and check out our Slack workspace. Because if you ask that question there, you'll get a long list of resources and ideas. I like to point out to my students that for the cost of one textbook, you can own almost all the major books in the, in the field of data viz, uh, Stephen Few's books, uh, Alberto Cairo's books, uh, Cole Newsbomber that, that you mentioned, um, you know, you can uh, go on, on Amazon and, and all of those books are, you know, 20 to $30 and you can build up a nice library and it's a great place to start. Uh, then, then hit the blogs and, and, and see their content. A lot of published uh, work uh, out in the, in the blog sphere on that. Well, well, Gloria, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> take a different turn from my colleagues and say, oh, my God, get out while you still can. <laughs> 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 you know, you're, you're still at the point, you know, you, you'll never be able to look at a chart in a magazine or newspaper and go, is this the best way to show this? I don't know. So, uh, um, no, it's actually a wonderful uh, community that will help you tremendously learn how to do this stuff. We've mentioned a bunch of books and, and resources about this, um, and we hope you will join us uh, on the next chart chat. So bigbookofdashboards.com, you can find where chart, uh, chart chat is. My guess is in uh, within a short period of time, we will have the video up there again, as well as a link to when our next chart chat is. Uh, Jeff, it is always a delight and I learned a ton of stuff. I also didn't know that the GG stand stood for the, uh, in GG pot stood for the grammar of graphics. Um, and Amanda, absolutely delighted to have you join us here today. Thank you so much. Yes, please come back. Thanks, guys. And hope to see you all on the Data Visualization Society Slack and seeing everyone engaging there. Excited to carry around this conversation. Okay. Thank you all so much. Bye.